Welcome to the Road Traveled Podcast, the show where I sit down with people doing interesting things with their lives and explore the various paths that they've taken to get there and talk about the experiences they've had along the way. On today's episode, we have guest Jacob Morris. Jacob runs a talent agency called Good Fun, where he represents some of social media's top influencers, many of which you'll probably recognize in your own social media feeds. In today's episode, we talk about how sometimes you have to pass up on a really good opportunity to go after the things that you really want to do. All of the success I've had um, from a business perspective has come from decisions that I made to pursue side projects as opposed to like maybe taking the safe the safe route. You know, I did a, a running campaign in, in 2016 uh, where I did 10 half marathons across Canada uh, to support or build awareness for, for mental health initiatives and then also kind of tell my own personal story with mental health, uh, you know, dealing with depression and anxiety. Uh, running is kind of my main coping mechanism for that, so mm-hmm. I really wanted to pursue that project. And that got me a lot of connections in, in kind of the health and fitness world, which I then was able to transition a little bit into my other work. Um, and that only came about because I said no to a job offer. I was offered a job right before that running campaign salary position, like health benefits in Vancouver where I wanted to live for a long time. And I was just like, it just didn't feel right. I've recently made some updates to the website, so it is now easier to navigate between the specific episodes and you can find all of the links to where the show is posted. You can find everything at jessedhunt.com slash the road traveled. Enjoy the show. Satisfying. Very. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for being here, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Of course. That's a that's a great intro. I think I'm going to keep that. <laughs> I usually try to do something more official, but I don't know. That uh, seems very good. Yeah. So, I like so, it. Yeah. So today on the show, we have Jacob Morris. Jacob, you and I just met. Uh, we were connected online uh, via a mutual friend, Miguel Barbosa, who also appeared on the podcast in its infancy, like three months ago, I think. And his was a great episode. I've got a lot of great feedback about his episode and is also doing... It's probably in second place as far as downloads go online, which is really oh, cool. Amazing. Yeah. So cool. I'm glad that he introduced us. Yeah, absolutely. I, there's nothing like, I mean, I feel like it happened so much more back in the day of people just, that's actually, I feel like how I know Miguel is back in the day, just like some random Twitter connection Yeah. who, you know, like who, someone who, who's doing creative things in the city. Totally. You start following that person. You just, you know, you build up a relationship online. I feel like that doesn't really happen as much these days. So whenever, you know, someone points out, Hey, there's this person. I was like, yeah. yeah. Well, connect. That's how um, that's how him and I met. Also, it was like oh, an cool. online thing. Yeah, where where did you grow up? Uh, Waterloo, so Waterloo. just outside of of you know an hour and a half away from Toronto. Mm-hmm. Uh, but moved here. I'm coming up. I realized this year, in August, I'll have been in Toronto for a decade. Wow. I'm like that is a long time. <laughs> I came here for school. I did radio and television arts at Ryerson. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, just realizing that that it's been a decade. I'm like, that's a significant portion of my life. What am I, what have I done? <laughs> You're like most of your adult life. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. How old are you? Uh, I will be, this is also a good question. I'm turning 29. Okay, cool. Uh, this, this may. Nice. Yeah. So a third of my life, essentially, yeah. just over. It's crazy, man. Wait till you cross the 30 mark and then you start really being like, oh, so I guess I have to get a job now or do <laughs> something know. with my life. Yeah. I mean, you're constantly with each year, you're just taking stock of like, what have I accomplished? Your accomplishments really start to rack up in a, in a way where it's kind of like, Hmm, that, yeah. I used to think that was cool, but maybe not anymore. I noticed I did, uh, I forget why I was downtown. Uh, and this was a few months ago, but I was just on the Ryerson campus or walking through the, the campus for some reason. Yeah. And I just, I was like, you know, just noticing people who were around and I was just like, these people are babies. These people look so young. And then I was like, no, I'm just, old yeah you're just old <laughs> exactly comparatively comparatively yeah. of course like you know. i wouldn't have known though unless i asked I'm, I'm 31 and i was like this very good chance that he's the same age as me so i yeah. kind of expect you to say i'm 35 and then i was gonna feel young or i could go i could go the the opposite way i mean if people are watching the video you're gonna be like yeah i could see that but like yeah. i'll be playing video games and people will be like oh that guy's got a high voice yeah he's, he could be five sure <laughs> it's the facial hair that does it yeah yeah <laughs> I, that's I gotta why, keep that's, it. That's I why keep I keep it. facial hair so people don't mistake me for yeah, being as a youngin. As, as soon as I started growing it, I got ID'd at the LCBO less. Yeah. So I was like, this is a positive in my life. Exactly. My wife always gets ID'd um, even when I'm there. And I feel like it's kind of weird because it's kind of like, all right, 
she's married to me. Yeah. You don't ask me. So yeah. you're just assuming that I'm like a cradle robber, like I married know. to some super young woman. <laughs> yeah. I get the same thing. My girlfriend Paige, she's, she's really short. Okay, especially, you know, I'm not that I'm like the tallest person in the, in the room, but like can, when we walk up to, yeah, the cashier at the LCBO or something, she could easily, if she's like turned around, be, yeah, a, a young sister or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's hilarious. Yeah. So before we get into it, why don't you just give me a little bit of background on who you are, what you do, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, I mean, like I said, I, I went to Ryerson for radio and television arts. I had you know, growing up kind of aspirations to be a director or, you know, doing something probably a little bit more creative in the field of film and television. Sure. As I kind of went through uh, school and then also just had a bunch of side projects. I've always been someone to have like a million side projects at once. Um, I got a lot more interested in kind of the business aspects of, of things. Cool. You know, every production needs someone who, who loves a spreadsheet and yeah. I'm the guy who loves the spreadsheet. I feel like every day, you know, I'm sending my, my brother something of like, Oh, like we could get a cottage and like, this is a pipe dream, but like get right. a cottage and like, you know, we're breaking down the, this, the, you know, the financial, the, the plans. financial <laughs> plans of this and, and then just, you know, buying Christmas gifts, you know, we're like breaking down things and that just bleeds into the work I do too. So, um, yeah, several years ago, uh, and what I do now is, 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 uh, talent management in the kind of influencer space. Cool. So yeah, I mean, for a lot of my life after school, uh, it's been 50, 50 kind of video production producing, um, you know, everything from music videos to kind of, uh, you know, more, uh, digital brand spots, you know, ad spots for like Facebook and that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, a l for a little while I was working in kind of entertainment news which was like shooting and editing celebrity interviews gotcha. uh, for, for a website um but then yeah primarily now what i'm focused on is is representing um you know digital influencers you know top people who are who have uh, a lot of followers on instagram i'm the guy who's you know the middleman between brand x who wants to work with this person um and and the the person who's actually going out and taking photos and and yeah turning their Instagram I guess into a and other platforms into a business. Very cool. Yeah. So how did you get into that? Because it seems like a very niche thing, and you never it's just never something you would think about. What everybody yeah. has Instagram, everybody follows these people. I looked looked all your people up, and I, I follow a, a good chunk of them, and it never occurred to me that hey, they have a manager. Or a, yeah. a, a talent, whatever. Yeah, it's like a kind a of rep, 50 50. A rep is a, is a great term yeah. for it. It's kind of 50 50, like management and agent, but it's such a new space, too. And that's kind of how I got into it. Sure. Um, that, you know, the definitions around like what the roles are in, in a company like this or like a relationship with this talent is kind of being defined on a daily basis as like new opportunities pop up and, and you know, what you have to take on kind of from a day-to-day -day basis kind of changes. Mm -hmm. um, how I got into it was it was one of those side projects I was talking about. So in second year of Region and Television Arts, um, I was roommates with this guy named Scott Fisher, uh, and he uh, and I and, and a few other friends uh, produced what is essentially like a knockoff of The Hills okay. uh, for Toronto starring uh, Gigi Gorgeous, who's this, this YouTube top YouTuber. Um, and, you know, that kind of got a little bit of buzz in, in Toronto and, and kind of some of the talent on that, including Gigi is kind of the top one. Um, you know, brands were recognizing, oh, like there's this person with a lot of followers, like we can monetize that. Yeah. But you, you, like you kind of alluded to, you know, you don't really think of these people having kind of a representative. Yeah. But it makes sense um, in terms of, you know, if, you know, Uber wants to come and advertise with someone and they send them like a 14 page contract with all of these crazy terms and they can use their image and likeness for, you know, forever sure. and like, you know, put your face on billboards and stuff. Um, it would make sense to kind of have that person with a little bit of knowledge on the business side of things to be like, no, like, I think it's worth this much. And yeah. I think like you have to take care of that. Um, so yeah, a lot of it was just like diving my teeth into a lot of different side projects as the business was kind of shifting to where, you know, the word influencer got a little bit more defined. I yes. Guess. That's cool. So how many side products do you have going right now? Um, good question. So the main one, obviously, is, is the talent management. Yep. I would say my new puppy is definitely a, a, a big side project who's taken quite a bit of my time. Um, <laughs> the puppy manager, too. Yeah. One of my, 
I guess one of my big goals too for 2019 is to just be writing more. Cool. I think that's something that uh, has been like a little bit lacking in my life, but something that I want to dive a little bit more into as we kind of progress, um, in, or, or as I progress, uh, just because I'm focusing so much on the work I'm doing right now, I'm not leaving a lot of time to be pursuing, at least in the last few months, the passions that I have. Sure. Um, one thing or a couple of things that I try to, uh, take on is like, and I consider these side projects, uh, you know, my rec soccer team and the running that I do, Mm -hmm. I try to put in as much effort into like that kind of thing, uh, and focus on like how well my rec soccer team is doing as much as I'm focusing on like the contract that needs to be signed by the end of the day. Gotcha. Just because like I said, uh, I'm, I'm really needing to like find that balance right now. Mm -hmm. Um, just because things have taken off a little bit. Like it's been pretty successful over the last, I'd probably say 12 months. Um, on the business side of things, which is, I mean, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, but I have found also that that also detracts from some of these more side projects that I've, I've enjoyed doing in the past. Yeah, it's amazing how quickly one thing in your life can take over. Yeah. And the rest of all the other good things, uh, you know, whether it's a negative influence is taking over or a positive one. And in this case, I'd say you're, you're, you enjoy your business. So it's a good one, but it's amazing how fast that can take over every other part of your life. Yeah, and absolutely. It becomes negative all of a sudden in a weird way. And I think almost to a certain extent, like some of, or not some, I would say probably all of the success I've had, um, from a business perspective, which isn't like amazing success or anything, but just like being able to support myself. Sure. Um, has come from decisions that I made to pursue side projects as opposed to like maybe taking the safe, the safe road. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one of the reasons or one of the ways I got into working with, cause the talent I represent, it's kind of like half or was half kind of fitness and lifestyle and half kind of travel people, people in those niches. Mm -hmm. The way I got into kind of the fitness one is, you know, I did a, a running campaign in, in 2016, uh, where, um, I was essentially shooting like a lot of footage for a documentary, which is knock on wood and hopefully come out sometime. <laughs> um, but anyway, so it was a running campaign. I did 10 half marathons across Canada, uh, to support, uh, aware or build awareness for, for mental health initiatives, including CAMH here in Toronto. Uh, and then also kind of tell my own personal story with mental health, uh, you know, dealing with depression and anxiety. Uh, running is kind of my main coping mechanism for that. Mm-hmm. So I really wanted to pursue that project. Um, and that got me a lot of connections in, in kind of the health and fitness world, which I then was able to transition a little bit into my other work. Um, and that only came about because I said no to a, uh, a job offer. I was offered a job right before that running campaign, salary position, like health benefits in Vancouver, where wow. I wanted to live for a long time. And it was a decently sized salary. Yeah. And I was just like, it just didn't feel right. Interesting. Like I didn't really want to do it. It was something that like, I kind of fell into my lap through a friend and it just kind of happened to work out that they offered me the job. Um, and that would have been like one path to take, but it just, I didn't feel like it was going to be the right thing to do. So I ended up doing the running campaign and, and put my, <laughs> put myself into to debt, like thousands of dollars into debt by like running around the country, doing half marathons, producing a documentary that still hasn't come out. <laughs> uh, but I, I think that that was so worthwhile. Yeah. Do you regret that decision at all? To not take the job? Uh, to na- not take the job, go into debt and do what sounds like it was your passion? No, absolutely not. Yeah. No, that is, I mean, there, I thrive on those kind of situations where it feels like, or it not doesn't feel it. If it, you know, on paper, it would look like you're an, idiot like <laughs> why are you doing this yeah um i love those situations because i love like i love the pressure of figuring things out that's why you know i loved uh when i was doing more video producing like just those high pressure situations where you know multiple things are bound to go wrong and yeah. it's just about you know dealing with them exactly. as best as you can uh and being prepared to be able to deal with those things sure um one of my other favorite stories is that i so i left my job at the entertainment news website right i quit that uh I quit that job three days after I moved into a new uh, place with my girlfriend and a roommate that was like significantly more money than like we were paying at right. another place. So I took on this big financial investment and then just quit my job. I was like, nah, I don't really, I'm not really passionate about doing that anymore. <laughs> I don't want to be there anymore. Uh, so I quit my job. And then two weeks after that, a friend of mine from Vancouver, who's actually the connection who kind of hooked me up with that maybe job, she flew into Toronto. 
or she was flying into Toronto and, and she gave me a call and was like, hey, I'm coming to Toronto and we haven't like collaborated on anything recently. I'd love to throw a party. And I was like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea to me. Let's throw a party. And she's like, there'll be installations. There's going to be like our uh, different artists, like musicians from Toronto. Uh, we'll just make this party. We'll find a space and we'll go and do this thing. Um, and she was she was like, and you'll be the business guy. Like you'll be the, sp- essentially you'll be the spreadsheet guy. Right. The producer. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I mean, that sounds, that sounds like a stupid idea, but that sounds fun to me. Uh, <laughs> so I remember being on the, the balcony of my new place and my brother had come up to see the place and we're just hanging out and having a couple of beers on the, on the balcony. And he's like, oh, like, so what are you up to? And I, I told him about the party and I told him how, you know, we need to finance, like we need some startup costs. So I told him uh, I'd cashed out my RRSP <laughs> to, to from the job that I just quit to be able to have the have money to, for to fund this party. <laughs> Which talking to you, I I have I've wrote a post about it, but I didn't really yeah. I didn't really ever haven't really like, spoken about that before. That sounds like a really stupid thing. To do. Um, but it worked out. We made like I think we made profit like fifty dollars each or something. Like nice. That. And I recouped my money. So you recouped your money. So it was yeah. all worth it. Yeah, absolutely. So did did doing that kind of like spark a like. Uh, what's that term fight or flight type thing where it's kind of like I have cashed in all of my money if I don't do like if I don't pull this off I'm kind of in a bad place or was it never about that it was just like I just want to do something really cool and I'm totally okay making this investment if I make money back sweet if I don't you know yeah. whatever it's the experience again like I think it, it looked really bad on paper sure. but in my mind I'm just like oh we needed money like I have an RSP yeah. and I have like you know I hadn't worked there for a super long time so it wasn't a huge amount of money but I was like here's some money we can use. Yeah. I didn't even think about it being like a, a terrible idea. You're the opposite, the exact opposite of any producer that I have ever come across. <laughs> I know. The producers, like they have the, um, the, the guys I work with, I love them all, but they're, they're usually the ones that are first to say because of the paper, like, no, don't do that. Yeah. Whereas as the artist, I'm like, I need more money to do this stupid idea. Yeah. So you're just kind of like laying it on the spreadsheet and then it's kind of like delete. Spend all my money. <laughs> yeah. That reminds me of working with Miguel a little bit too. Mm-hmm. Not that he's like, not that that's unprofessional because I th- I admire that yeah. that about him a lot is that like there is that kind of gorilla aspect to it. Yeah. Where you know like we didn't shoot with permits a lot of the time. Yeah. We we did when we absolutely needed them. I mean I think he even talked about that on the podcast. He did. Yeah. Um. But you know. Hey, yeah, it's a, you know it's the stupid idiom of like you know it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to prefer for per- permission as long as you're being safe about it right well that's a thing right and and you know the the person in the back of my head would always if there was you know any kind of danger of like we the production was going to be shut down or you know any risk to you know anyone's safety or health or well being or something like that I mean mm-hmm. that would always be a case where like yeah we ha- like if we're shooting in a rickety basement where the house may fall down on us like yeah we really do need that insurance policy to be able to cover the production yeah definitely um but otherwise yeah I think there is uh, there is something to be said about like uh pursuing things like that in this day and age where a lot of the stuff being made is just like it's got to be 100 percent brand safe and like I got an email this morning and we went back and forth with the the guy it was some like I won't say his name, but it was like a, a vape company okay. in, in, it's in Toronto, a vape company. And they were like, you know, we want this person, this influencer to, you know, they got a bunch of Instagram followers. They're from Toronto. We want them to share our brand assets on your Instagram page. And we're like, uh, like, I don't think so. And this is kind of where I step in. These are my emails. I'm like firing back and forth. Like, yeah. you know, if you want to collaborate with this person, this person's a photographer, you know, they would do a really good job shooting creative scenes that integrate your vape pen. Yeah. Uh, but it's not going to really benefit anyone to, to be sharing, you know, just brand created assets that are like, you know, that have been pre-cleared by lawyers and stuff. So what they wanted them to like, just like post a picture of this vape pen on their yeah. account kind of thing. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I'm, and their reasoning was, you know, we, because of regulations in the market, like we want just to make sure that everything's been cleared and we're like, I understand that, but at the same time, this photographer isn't gonna share a photo of like a vape pen that you shot in some like random place to their personal feed. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense. And their whole reasoning is, yeah, we want to be like, gotta please the lawyers, which just doesn't. It's not really fun. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's weird. So these influencers, did you um, like? 
you said you, you knew one of them, I guess. And then did you just like reach out to some of these people? Was like part of like a pitch being like, hey, you need somebody looking out for your business interest type thing? Yeah. So a little bit of a little bit of that and a little bit of uh, just kind of convincing them that I was the right person for the job by gotcha. kind of proving myself. Um, most of my clients that I'm working with now have actually just been through word of mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I probably started with people who are on my roster right now. I maybe started working with three, two or three of them, um, kind of individually, everyone else has kind of been built off of recommendations, sure. uh, from each, each person, which is no different from kind of any other field, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the, the way I got into it is I sold, there was a, a tea company in Montreal that, uh, I just like cold emailed okay. and I was like, Hey, do you want to, uh, you know, market your matcha tea to, to, you know, people on this health and wellness influencers page. And they're like, yeah, like we haven't really done that. Maybe. So I convinced them, yeah, you know, we'll do this post for X amount of dollars Nice. and, uh, sold it to that person and slowly kind of built up a little rapport with them where they trust, you know, the random guy here in Toronto, because that's the other thing is that most of my clients aren't even from here. Right. A lot of my clients, most, most of my clients I haven't even met face to face, right. which is kind of a strange thing too. Oh, don't you love the internet though? <laughs> I know. Well, that's the thing, right? Like it's so, it's honestly so strange to be sitting here talking to you face to face because we probably could have gone back and forth on Twitter. Like, like we talked about earlier, like had a relationship on Twitter for like four years before we even, you know, stumbled into each other. 100%. We could have, I could have Skyped you. We could have done this like across yeah, the city. Exactly. We didn't have to sit down like this. Yeah. There are a lot of podcasts that do that. Exactly. Absolutely. No, that's why I like this one too, because it looks cool. And it is that kind of like personal touch. I, I do like the being able to sit with somebody and because I've done podcasts over Skype before where I've been the guest and I always have a hard time connecting with the person on the other end for whatever reason, it's just nicer to be in the same room. Yeah. Well, I think that, I mean, that's, that's true about any kind of communication, it I think, because yeah. I'll be sitting there and like my day to day is either phone calls or emails mm-hmm. and it's, you know, I'm typing and typing, typing, typing. And sometimes people, you'll get a response of just like, this person is so stupid. Like they don't understand what I'm saying. Yeah. And then I'm, they're like, they're probably saying the exact same thing on the other end. And it's maybe just a stupid miscommunication or maybe it's just like someone trying to passively being like, as per my last email, right. just like playing the stupid email games back and forth. But then, yeah, like you definitely lose on some of that kind of like, you know, reading between the lines when you are sitting with someone where you can come to a much easier understanding. Exactly. Like I, I would imagine probably if I was able to go and meet with, you know, all the brands that I'm dealing with on a daily basis, we probably would be doing so many more deals. Mm-hmm. The flip side of that, I suppose, is like. I can't be in every country at once meeting with people in their boardrooms to yeah. close these deals. So, I mean, there's a positive and negative to, to the kind of communication over the years, yeah. I guess. I totally get how it would be beneficial to, even if you just met them once, because then they'd be able to see, oh, hey, Jacob's actually like a really chill guy outside yeah. of like, you know, I'm sure emails are very well worded, but yeah, like you said, there's tons of miscommunication that can happen often uh, no fault of your own. This is what I found. If the person on the other end, on the receiving end, is in a bad mood, then they may read your email a different way than you had intended. And yeah. that sucks for you. Yeah. And, and that, there's nothing you can do about it. Well, that's something, and it's funny you say that, because that's something that I try to be aware of for myself personally on a daily basis, yeah. because I am doing so many emails. And sometimes, you know, I haven't had my coffee yet. And, right. you know, I'm, I'm the guy who's reading it. Like, this person is just like, totally trying to screw with me yeah. and then I have that cup of coffee and then try to think about oh maybe not and reread it and like nah they're okay they're, yeah. they're actually nice it's amazing how fast that can happen like if somebody like misspells something my brain will be like this guy's an idiot like he doesn't know yeah. what he's talking about and he's obviously an amateur yeah when that's not the case at all he's typing on his phone as he's running after a streetcar yeah well that <laughs> that's something too that I think and I mean it kind of changing gears a little bit but that kind of thinking totally kills some creativity these mm-hmm. days I think because people are just so, like second guessing everything that they do. And exactly. they're like, oh, is it worth it? You know, I was, there was, I was with a friend last night and she was talking about, um, you know, oh, like, uh, uh, how am I going to say this without them seeing it and knowing it? <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, there was some person who was concerned about how they were going to look on Instagram because they haven't posted a lot of selfies recently. Gotcha. And it's just like, okay, it was such a strange issue, but I guess an issue of the time. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and but they were just... And, and, but the reason that they hadn't posted, you know, a photo of themselves on their personal account, you know, why wouldn't you post a photo of yourself or like what you're doing? Um, 
is because she was just second guessing like, oh, like, am I pretty enough? Like, do I, like, is this my personal brand? Like, is this, like, do I, should I put on a different filter? Which I understand, like, I understand it because this is the bit, like the business that I'm in, right? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's like a little piece of me. And this is why I got to like go and focus my rec soccer team for a while. Yeah. So my, my whole life isn't about like just all the minute details that don't really matter at yeah. the end of the day. It's kind of like, Barbara, your 200 followers aren't going to care. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Sure. I, like that, that sounded kind of mean. And I, that, I meant that like passively in the sense that like she probably has more followers and she's probably very pretty and yeah, yeah. not in an offensive way. But like there are the, the thing is, there are lots of people that have like 50 followers and they think the same way. And it's kind yeah. of like, come on. Yeah. There's way more important things. And just from a, like a, like, that's kind of the perspective that I take in onboarding the, the like new talent that I'm trying to work with is I try to work with people. And a lot of the time this comes through and just like my conversations with them and that kind of stuff, yeah. um, working with people who are like passionate about, you know, taking like producing videos and like they're, they're psyched about an edit and a, uh, a video edit transition mm -hmm. in, in a, you know, the latest YouTube video or something as opposed to the kind of, person that's only posting selfies with like the most random product that probably doesn't even work and then the caption is just like a random uh you know health benefit claim that is bogus yeah um I, I, I try to at least sway people to, to put more authenticity into things that'd be probably a little bit more strategic with it right yeah well that's the thing too is that it's funny like if you're so particular about what you're doing and you're not letting some of your own personality bleed through into your creative pursuits, um, I think you actually kill what your personal brand actually could be mm -hmm. uh, it, it, or take away a lot of, you know, what, it, what the positives could be from that. Yeah. If I'm always, you know, even on my personal Instagram account, if I'm sitting there like, ah, like I don't look good in this one, I'm not going to post it. Like people, if, if they are only seeing like this amazing selfie, who's really going to, who's really going to care? Like they're going to see it, like it scroll past it, but they're not really going to know who I am because right. you know, I'm also like this, this stupid goof who's like running through my house playing with my puppy or like, you know, in basketball shorts until like, you know, two in the afternoon sometimes yeah. just sitting around on my couch, uh, being the guy who's just, this person hates my email. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> But like that's authentically who I am. But it's yeah, it's just a strange, strange world. It's a strange time, uh, and I can say like I agree with you. I know exactly what you're talking about. I've caught myself many times being like, I shouldn't post this because it makes me look like I'm a bad photographer, or a bad filmmaker, whatever yeah. it may be. And it's kind of a shame that that's what we've become. But like you said, a problem of the times. That was kind of the going back to like the running campaign I did. That was kind of the impetus behind that. Um, the kind of the large message around that whole campaign was that. Um, vulnerability isn't actually a weakness. It can be a strength if you're showing that in the right way. Yeah. Uh, you know, the whole campaign was was built off of me being, you know, or me having been depressed, like really fucking depressed. Can I swear? So, yeah, yeah, you're good. <laughs> for for uh, you know a year, a year and a half, um, and developed like severe anxiety, mm -hmm. and I got to the point where like I didn't. Like I, I didn't know how to deal with that, first of all, but I didn't want to share that with anyone because I was just like, if people, once I started to realize what it was, who wants to share that with people? Because that's, you know, that's, I saw that as kind of a negative toward me. You right. know, I'm someone who uh, likes to be perceived as like high functioning, someone who's dependable, who's always on time, who gets the, the work done um, and can be happy, go lucky, run into a room and just be like, try to make friends with everyone. Sure. But that got really, really, really hard to do. Um, and it got to the point where I was like, I'll either probably die or I can start talking about how I'm actually feeling. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and that's what I was talking about. Of like your personal brand can be more positive if you're actually being authentic to yourself. And, you know, once I started opening up about that and sharing that with more people and then decided to do this running campaign, you know, the whole idea was to run 10 half marathons. Uh, in 10 different or 10 different cities across Canada. Okay. Only because like that is just some like huge lofty goal. And before I even started out on that, I ran only three half marathons wow. in, my, in my life. And I did the whole campaign in 23 days. Wow. Congratulations. That's huge. <laughs> That's very cool. Um, and I was like, I don't know. Again, it was one of those things where, like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to complete it. I don't know if it's going to happen, but the whole idea was like, there's this massive challenge in front of me and I'm just going to try. Like yeah. I'm just, it's the same. That's kind of how I th see depression and anxiety. It's like, 
it, it's a really huge deal. It's a really hard, hard deal for a lot of people, uh, myself included. And um, just, you know, taking that first step toward being like, yeah, I'm dealing with this and I'm going to try to get through it is that's kind of, that was kind of the whole methodology behind that campaign, I guess. That's awesome. How important is it? Um, cause we're talking about being authentic and what we share with, with, you know, our followers, whoever it may be, how important is it, uh, for oneself to be authentic with themselves, you know, maintain that level of like, no, this is who I am. This is what I'm all about. And I'm going to, I'm going to focus on doing this for myself. That's a really hard thing to do. And that's, that's tough. I mean, I try to do that. I don't know exactly how I try. Let me think about it. What, what, what do I do? It's just interesting because right now, um, you know, I'm guilty of the exact same thing. It's, it's, it always feels like the things that I want to try and improve myself are as a like, oh, this is, I'm going to look like this to other people now. You know, it's always kind of based right. in like looking a certain way for other people. Yeah. Um, when in the last year, there, you know, I, I've learned a lot about myself in the last year just from turning inwards a lot more and being more intentional. Yeah. About thinking about these things and not caring about anybody else and trying to like learn more about how I function as a person, how I can deal with some of the things that I have going on uh, and not caring about how it kind of reflects with other people. So I'm just curious what your point of view is on that. Yeah. I mean, and that kind of goes back to why I want to write more this year Mm -hmm. is that something that that's how I kind of work a lot of that stuff out for myself is, is, you know, writing about it. And as I'm kind of like flowing through that, oftentimes it's just my phone. Like I'm like just typing on notes or something like that. Um, you kind of come to realizations of like, oh, this thing I just wrote about how I feel like isn't actually how I feel. It's just kind of, it's being influenced by some other factor. Sure. Um, just talking to other people too is a good way to be like, you know, is that actually what I care about uh, or, or what I should be pursuing? Mm-hmm. I think, yeah, it's, it's tough to, in a world where like, and I've mentioned it multiple times already, like your personal brand in a world where like everyone has their personal brand and having an identity is so important. It's so easy to get locked in to be like, Oh, I'm the, I'm the, the person who wears like, like clear glasses. Like that's so me. It's like right. where it gets to the point where it's difficult to even change like something as simple as your, your eyeglasses because it's going to affect like how you perceive yourself. And as a result, how other people are going to perceive you. Yeah. The thing is, though, is, and I, I say this to, uh, you know, my girlfriend and I talk about this topic a lot, too, is that th- um, the way people perceive you is often wildly different from how you perceive yourself. It's true. And the things that you are thinking inward on yourself is often, like, no one would ever pick up on that kind yeah. of stuff. It's amazing how many times, like, you'll be super insecure about something to the point of, like you know, wanting to change that thing so much about yourself, but then somebody comes along and compliments it. Yeah. And it's kind of like, I never would have imagined that. Yeah. Like you're hating on that one aspect of your, yourself so much. And then somebody comes along and is like, Hey, I, this is really sick. I really like your hair today. <laughs> totally. totally. <laughs> yeah, I, that's my girlfriend. I talk about this a lot. She's a, she's an actress and performer okay. and she's, she's always, uh, you know, she'll go to an audition or she'll be, uh, you know, rehearsing a song to, for a musical audition or something like that. Um, and she'll go into the audition, come back, be like, ah, I don't know if like, she's the, she's this yesterday. She went to two auditions over the last couple of days. She came back yesterday. like, ah, like I had a call back, but like I had the, I read the room and like someone's face was kind of like, okay, thanks. Yeah. And she was like, oh, I didn't get it. And then she got back later and I was like, no, like, I don't think so. Like I, it, the way you described it, it sounds like it, it was pretty good. Yeah. And, and she was on put on hold for it. That's amazing. So she, I, I don't, we don't know yet if she's, you know, booked a hundred percent for it, but yeah. she got put on hold and that's just, you know, in that industry is especially, I think, where you you're walking to a casting room and you have five minutes to just like be looked at and be like, nah, yeah, you're not right, or you are right. <laughs> it's for a lot a lot of time for commercial auditions too, it's right? Got to be the hardest thing. Yeah, like I did a twelve hour audition, uh, like casting session last week, and I felt so bad because literally I was seeing people for two minutes. That's all it took. Yeah. And they're taking so much time out of their day. People were coming because they'd look on the on their sheet and it would be like, oh, here's my phone number. The area code's like way out there. Yeah. You know, uh, I was told people were coming in from Ottawa and it's like, it's, it is tough. Uh, I, I try to give everybody at least, you know, two reads. Yeah. But some <laughs> people are just like, no, you got to cut them off right away. And I just like, I'm just like, I feel so bad about it. I know. That. Yeah. It's got to be the hardest thing. And, and you're just doing your job, right? Like that's, that's. It's your job, but it is, there's that human aspect where you're just like, 
you see the light go out in there. Oh, totally. <laughs> and like, yeah, I'm like sitting in a row of five people and I'm like smiling. Like, yeah. that was awesome. Good work. Thank you very much for coming in. Yeah. And everybody else is like look, <laughs> looking at their phone. <laughs> and like, I just the way you described what your girlfriend goes through, it just makes me feel so much more like, guys, you got to pay attention to this. Yeah, <laughs> this absolutely. people's lives. And yeah. how are they going to ever get better? Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, is like, yeah, that's their livelihood, right? It's yeah. not just about their identity. It's just like, that's how you make money. Exactly. Well. And it's just like, if, Am I not good enough? Yeah. So there are some people though that get cut off right away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they just have to. I'm sorry. Thanks for coming from Ottawa. You're you get back on the train. Yeah. <laughs> if it's like a it's like a five word script and they're like, uh, line, you're out. Ooh. You're out. <laughs> oh, that'd be me. I couldn't do that. I don't think. <laughs> I'd be the guy who forgets the line. For sure. Um, so I watched your TED talk and TEDx talk. Uh, that makes one it, of us. You haven't watched I haven't it, yet. Seen it yet. Really? No. This, was, this was like a year ago or a year and a half ago. I haven't watched it. That's no. amazing. I'm too nervous. I'm the same. I don't watch my stuff once it's done. Um, I thought it was really cool, though. I really liked it. And you talked a lot about uh, perspective. And one of the lines that I wrote down here, uh, and you may, I think you touched on it just a minute ago, but uh, when you show vulnerability, you give yourself the opportunity to build strengths. Right. Where'd that come from? Um, that came from, that probably. Was that the first half or the second half of the TED Talk? Do you I feel like remember? that was the second half. Maybe. Yeah, that, it, it was, was after you was, had kind of gone into things. It was probably the second half because uh, I had. So I came back from New York City that morning. Okay. And I was really nervous. I came earlier. I was with my girlfriend, two of our friends in New York, and I came back early on an earlier flight. So I was alone, and I was alone in my head that whole time. And I was the guy, like I said, who would forget that five line script because I had been going over for weeks trying to memorize my talk and I couldn't do it. <laughs> so I was so nervous. And I was like, should I bring cue cards? Like, no, that'll look unprofessional. Like no one else is. They said no. Um, so I forgot my entire speech, my entire talk, at, like a third or half of the way through. So if it was in the second half, that was completely like out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Just pulling it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but I think... Again, it's less me to like have a rehearsed talk. Mm -hmm. It's more me to like get up there and just talk about something. So I think the second half is probably more authentic to, to who I am anyway. Right. Um, but yeah, so building building strength out of vulnerabilities. I think anything that you do in life can be uh, either one way or the other, depending on what your perspective is. Um, you can have a negative perspective on something or you can have a positive perspective on something. I and uh, I and people make fun of me for this all the time. I honestly believe, like I am telling you, I honestly believe that I could be a professional football player. I could be in the NFL. Like I really do believe that I could do that if I was wanted to do it. Like sure. if I wanted to try to do that. Um, but I think, and the steps that I would need to take to to make that happen would be, first of all, just embracing the vulnerability around acknowledging that I don't know shit about playing football. <laughs> like I wouldn't know how to do it, but I think that's what kills a lot of, again, like kills a lot of creativity, kills a lot of, um, uh, p people taking on different pursuits is because they just decide that they can't do something right. or they decide that they're they're Like I'm the person who can't do this. I'm the person that's that, that, um, uh, you know, any kind of negative, whether it's, it's depression or anxiety. And I don't want to necessarily use those because there are so many different variables involved that sometimes it is actually like a crushing thing. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but I think when you, yeah, embrace those vulnerabilities and you use them to, as, as fuel to be able to be like, I don't know how to do this right now but I'm working toward being able to do that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the perspective that I bring to most things, I think. Okay, cool. um, and that's, yeah, that's, I guess, how, how you build strength out of that, I suppose. Interesting. Very cool. Um, and, and you talked a lot about perspective, uh, which I guess kind of like goes into what we just talked about, but in the, in the sense of like, I don't know, I'm looking for something maybe more specific as far as um, for me, uh, something that I've gained. So uh, if you watch the first episode um, of the podcast where I talk about yeah. kind of my health story and stuff yeah. like that, and this is kind of like the most cliche thing ever to say, but like it definitely gave me a different perspective on life going through yeah. a hard time like that. Um, and it has taught me that uh, some of the most trying things that you can go through in life, uh, if you can adapt to pers your perspective a little bit, it becomes easier to deal with. Definitely. You, you find that yeah. also? Yeah. 
Um, it would be a, a whole different podcast that would probably go on for hours and hours and hours. But like my, I had a very, uh, turmoilful, uh, uh, youth period. Right. Uh, a lot of shit around kind of my parents' divorce, uh, a lot of stuff around me growing up, but I, yeah, I've never really like had uh, the perspective of like feeling sorry for myself mm -hmm. or, or not, not necessarily that, but like the perspective of, um, of something that's going to be hard. I've never perceived that as a barrier, right. I, I guess. Um, challenges are always just something that I need that I'm like, Oh, well, it's something else to get around. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's why I like distance running as well Okay, is that, you know, it's, I'm not a fast runner either. So like doing a half marathon, doing those half marathons is like, you know, it takes me a couple of hours. So it's a couple of hours of just like mundane, like running around. Yeah. And for a lot of people that's really boring, but I think I have a decent amount of patience and, and you know, when I'm working toward a goal, uh, yeah, there are very few things that I, that I at least there are very few, it's even, it's going to take me a while. There are very few things that are ever going to stop me. Sure. Do you find that you're a patient person? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think like I, I'm probably someone who could sit on a, a couch, like doing nothing. If I was told that I had to do that and just like be fine with that Yeah. for hours. That's awesome. Yeah. I find that, uh, cause I also would consider myself to be a patient person. I think that there are times that it has burned me being too patient, but then, then mm -hmm. there are times that it has definitely more often than not, it has definitely been an added benefit, uh, to whatever it may be that I'm working on or just, you know, doing with my life. Patience is always a good thing. Yeah. No, agreed. hundred percent. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's jump back to when, when your party, when okay. you decide to kind of go into that. Cause I think that, um, there's probably a lot of people that are at a stage or a point in their life where they, it's not just about spending the money and doing that big thing, but there's lots of people probably at the point in their life where they can go this direction or they can go this direction and they're probably nervous about it. Lots of different influences, I'm sure, kind of pushing in every direction. What is something that maybe you focused on or maybe looking back on it now? Because it was a few years ago, right? Like, what yeah. is something that you took away from that as far as like, oh, man, I wish I knew th this fact when I was making this decision? I think um, just like for that party in particular, I think uh, <clears throat> the, the biggest thing would be like, going back to patience, maybe be a little bit more patient with that. Okay. We did it on a, I think it was like a, a four, three or four week timeline to put this whole thing together. Wow. And, uh, but yeah, I think just, yeah, again, uh, em embracing like just trusting that things are going to work out as long as you work hard enough. And that was my mantra throughout the whole thing. And I think that that we did the, we did two parties okay. and the first party a hundred percent followed that to a T the second party did not. And it was not a success. We lost money on that one. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, because I think we got a little bit too cocky and we were like, Oh, like, yeah, it'll work out. It worked out the first time, but we like, didn't really put enough effort into sourcing the right kind of talent to come in. And we didn't really promote it in the right, the same kind of ways. Um, and, and didn't put that work in. We, we had the trust aspect. We we're like, it'll be fine. Uh, but we didn't put in the work. I don't think the second time around, Interesting. um, the first time around, it was just like, we kind of got a random, it was a random group of people together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the whole idea was just to like make it as, as not a Toronto party as you would expect. The only way we promoted the party, which we did, I think for only from a week or maybe 10 days out from the night, we did zero promotion, no Facebook event, no Instagram, no nothing, uh, except for, uh, we marketed it. We got a, we went to like Dufferin mall and got an old burner cell phone or a SIM card for an old burner cell phone and just, uh, text message people. Wow. And, uh, we were just promoting that blasting it out to a bunch of different phone numbers and then that spread and then that spread and then that spread. Um, and, uh, and, and that was a really cool thing that we did the first time, but then we didn't really like try to do that the second time. So I think put it being more intentional about what you're doing every single time. Mm-hmm is important. And that's something that I also try to remind myself on now that I've been working in, you know, talent management for full time, kind of three years is to remind myself, like, 
don't get too comfortable right here. Like try to keep doing something new every day. Exactly. Um, uh, and then, yeah. Oh, the first, the, the thing that I would always do, and I did the first two parties too, is always have your liquor license. Always make sure that you do that correctly. Sure. Cause the, <laughs> the cops showed up to the first one okay. uh, and I was just like, here you go officer. Don't worry. We're legit. Uh, Cause it was in an old butcher shop that we did. This. Okay. And, uh, and the cops were like, yeah, you're, you're, you're fine. Uh, and they complimented us because they're like, the only thing, the only problem I have, this is the police officers, like the only problem that I have is that you're blocking the sidewalk with too many people. Right. And we're like, yeah, but it, it's full in here. And they're like, well, congrats, but I mean, figure it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, we will, officer, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. So, yeah, so what I took away from that is pretty much just like, be intentional if you're gonna if you're yeah. gonna, whatever direction you're gonna choose whether it be go to the school or don't go to school start your career you know be an influencer be a video producer be whatever it may be be intentional about it and work hard every single day because uh the minute you think that you've figured it out you get hit in the head real hard by yeah. something that, <laughs> that it just reminds you that you don't have anything figured out. A hundred percent. And yeah. And, and the thing I would add to that too is, sh- is make sure that other people are aware of your intentions as well. Yeah. Especially when you're working in, you know, fields that are so competitive or really any field, like if you want something, like you have to make sure that you believe in what you're doing, mm-hmm. but then also like other people are aware of what you're doing. Yeah. Um, because especially in you know the world that we live in now where a lot of stuff is marketed on social media, you're promoting yourself on, you know, everyone has a fucking LinkedIn and whatever else. Yeah. Um, if you're not showing that to people, it's difficult to know that you exist. Exactly. And you also have to, um, if you make that decision, I remember reading something or hearing a podcast or something about a director that came up and he was, he was a filmmaker. He was doing all sorts of different media things, but he made the decision to become a director. And part of that was, that became his identity when people asked what he did it was no longer like oh i make videos or i you know i've done music videos or whatever it may be it was like no i'm a director yeah and you know just as important as doing it on social media or whatever it may be in person it it still feels weird when people ask me like my my go-to thing if people ask me it's like oh i work in advertising yeah that's just easier to say but then if they ask again that'll be more specific oh i direct commercials yeah um but before like i've been doing this for around 10 years now and up until two years ago i was oh i'm a video i make videos a broad range of things (laughs) i used to do the spreadsheet thing too and i uh i don't enjoy it as much as you do so i kind of got away from that (laughs) um yeah and i think that's one thing too one of the side projects that i did back in the day i somehow in ryerson you could do one of two things for your last term you either did um an internship uh, for it was like three months or something like that. You did nine to five for four days a week. Whoa. So you did an internship or you joined the class special project. Okay. And I was like, I'm going to do special projects <laughs> because I had a lot of other ideas that I wanted to work on at the time. I was like, I don't really want to be interning somewhere. Yeah. Uh, it's not for me. So I, I went and did special project and my special project that I got the equivalency of what someone who's been three months, four days a week doing nine to five was called cool dance moves <laughs> and cool dance moves <laughs> was a video project that I wanted to do. And I had done, I'd like started it low key in my first year at Ryerson. It was, um, essentially I am going to bring a camera to some place and hit record and I will go dance in front of the camera with music playing, which is not a new idea, yeah. but I was like, this is just something that I enjoy doing. It's like being weird in a public space. Yeah. Like I enjoy that. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> um, and somehow I convinced my, my advisor, who's like one of the executive producers of corner cast to, uh, to let me do this. And she was super cool about it too. She wow. was like, uh, Virginia Thompson. Uh, she was like, uh, yeah, I mean, who knows? It might not work. You're not going to go, probably not going to go viral, but like it's worth a shot. Like yeah. who knows? Plus, like, I was being really intentional about it. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm definitely going to do this. I'm going to put my all into it. Uh, and uh, we're going to make it good. Yeah. Uh, so she was on board with that. Uh, and the first one that we did, I went to Dundas Square. And I just, like, went there and danced in front of it. And people were, like, looking around like, this guy is, like, crazy. Uh, and then, but I put my all into it because when I walked back to church. Like, I lived at church in uh, Shooter. And I went to my apartment. And uh, I like was panting and I could taste blood for like an hour afterward. Cause I just went so hard. Yeah. Um, 
but anyway, that whole story was told for what reason? To uh, be intentional about what you're doing and, and go all and, in. And go all in on things. Yeah, because yeah. there there'd be someone like I don't I don't feel like I like a little part of me feels like I got away with something okay. being able to not do an internship and do this instead. But there's another part of me, and this is the part of me that always like supersedes everything else, which is the confidence part, which says. I probably put more effort into this cool dance move series than a lot of people did at their like shitty internships yeah. that they really didn't care about and they like printed paper all day. Well, yeah, a lot of people get interns so they can like put them in the basement and do all the grunt. Like in high school, my internship, I had to clean up the basement of some guitar shop. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And I was just like, and I, I've done so less stuff like that too. But I was just like, I don't have, I, I don't have time for this right now. I've got bigger plans. I'm gonna go I'm gonna cool dance, dance in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> uh, big question: Is there any video proof of this? Because I think it would be great in the oh, show. There's video proof. The the video proof is the Cool Dance Moves Dundas Square. That is the one to watch 100%. Yeah. All right, yeah. And we're going to cut to a commercial break now. Uh, cool Dance Moves at Young and Dundas. <laughs> Amazing. Um, do you still run regularly? Yeah, this has been something that I definitely need to do more of now. Again, it's the puppy has gotten away of sure. a lot of uh, the, my kind of daily routine stuff as of late. Um, but yeah, that's something I really want to do. I've been signing up for more, you know, some of the races that are in the spring throughout the summer here mm -hmm. in Toronto. First one's in April, cool. uh, which is a, I think it's an 8k in High Park, wow. which will be nice. Uh, there's a killer hill in there that's just like deadly to go up. Um, so that one will be fun. So I really need to go out and start training for that. Uh, but I haven't been running outside because it's been snowing and stuff. So yeah, it's I'm been just like, uh, I've, been, I've been using the weather as an excuse to, to not do that. Sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> but in terms of physical activity, yes, again, my soccer team. I, I picked up soccer randomly and that was like yeah. one of those things where like, I think I'm a soccer player now. And a year and a half ago, I was like, I'm going to sign up for some random soccer league. And I did that and I just have been playing constantly uh, and uh, and loving it too. Awesome. That's yeah. so important. Yeah. I, I've been plugging this a lot, but in the similar vein, something that I, uh, that I just got into is indoor rock climbing. Oh, very cool. So my wife and I go a lot, but I think it's very similar for me. It's like, it's almost therapeutic. I love the physical activity part yeah. of it, but I'm terrified of heights. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'm, I'm really good at this, but like, I don't want to go too high. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's cool because like you, I've been explaining it this way. Like I'll go one day and I'll be climbing a wall. I'll get halfway up, look up and be like, holy shit, that's really yeah. high. Come back down. I'll come home, psych myself up be like, I got to do this. I go back and I'll do it. And I come down and I, it has honestly been the biggest sense of accomplishment that yeah. I've ever felt. Oh, hundred percent. Which is crazy. And I love it. It's so freeing. I feel like I'm learning how to, uh, manage my brain a little bit, you know, yeah. like if I can force myself past that and I still like, there are times where I'll get to the top and I'll feel nauseous and my stomach hurts and it's kind of like, what's going on? Uh, I haven't looked down yet, but you're at the roof, so you know you're high. Yeah. Um, but just being able to do that, come back down and be like, oh, I, like, I pushed myself past that mental point. 100%. Feels so good. Yeah. The first half, the one of the three half marathons I ran before I did the campaign was the, it was the first one I ran. Um, I, <clears throat> was living kind of like by the lake shore in, in Liberty Village. I hate that place. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was a great place for running because you're so close to the lake shore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the time around the time that I was I was running consistently a lot more. So I'd go out and I would you know see how I was feeling. Maybe do you know five five kilometers, which is you know take me a half hour something like that. Twenty five minutes, half hour. Um, and then come back and then, you know, go the next day and maybe do six kilometers and go the next day a little further. But I never, I, I never went farther than 10 kilometers. I was like my, my cap, my max. I was like, wow, I accomplished that. It was amazing. Um, so one night, one evening, it, it was, I don't know, probably around, I forget when the sun sets, but it was just before sunset. And I went out to do a 5k, uh, and, and I did the 5k, but I did a, like a slightly different route than I had previously which is a nice loop from door my home back to my home okay but i went on a different route so like i had to run a little bit more to even get back to where i was thought it was going um so I, I i you know kept running a little bit further and i was like oh like i just did another kilometer like i'm feeling pretty good like it's nice and, and the sun's starting to go down I'm like why don't I just keep going and i just like added one more kilometer one more kilometer and in the back of my mind, I'm like, I should be running west, but yeah. I'm running north right now, uh, which is further away from home. And I just kept adding one more kilometer, one more kilometer. And I got to the point where I was up on Bloor Street. I was at Bloor and Bathurst, I think. And it was, I forget what festival it was, but there was a festival 
that had shut down the street. But because the sun was setting, like, it was a, it was a day thing. So, like, the, the streets were completely empty. There were no vendors or anything like that. But the street was still shut down. Yeah. So I just went onto the middle of the street, and I was running west. And uh, the sun was was going down, and it was kind of in the middle of the street. And it was, like, in my eyes. And, in, and probably half of this, like, beautiful vision that I'm having was just me, like, being... Uh, totally dehydrated and probably <laughs> like going a little bit nutty. Um, but I was like, oh, this is amazing. And I, I was up there on Bloor Street, which is pretty far away from Liberty, Liberty Village where I needed to be. And uh, I didn't have any money or anything on me to get home another way. Uh, so I just, you know, started running south dead. And by the time I got home, I had run a half marathon, which is 21.1 kilometers. And that's a lot. It's over double, like the, the farthest I had ever run. And I felt like the most amazing feeling of euphoria. Like I just accomplished this crazy thing. Like I was out there for over two hours. I was running. I was like, this is amazing. Like as you're crawling the, towards the front as door. As I'm crawling <laughs> towards the door. And I'm like, I'm like praying, please let the elevator bank in this like stupid condo building be working so I can get up to my, I was, we lived on 23rd floor. I was like in panic mode. I was like, if, if the elevators which were constantly down, if they're down, I'm dead. Uh, but I oh got gosh. up and I, I went in to our condo and I was just like, whoa, get me a glass of water. But like, whoa, that felt amazing. Like yeah. being able to accomplish something that you didn't even really think that you could do before or yeah. seemed like such a far away um, thing to accomplish. When you hit that, like if you're rock climbing and you get to the uh, top of like a, what do you call them? I don't even know. Uh, a place. wall. I don't what, know. Yeah. Whatever a the route. A route, route. A route. Yes, that's I, it. I knew there was something. <laughs> when you get to the, you like accomplish a route that you hadn't done before, didn't think that it was possible. That feeling has got to be amazing. Yeah. I feel like such a big baby about it because they're like, they're really not that high. It's just like, it's more of like just that, that small mental accomplishment for myself. But Yeah. But that's the other perspective that I always have too and I talked a lot about this in the mental health campaign, is that I ran the best run that I ever felt, the, uh, the, the most accomplishment that I ever felt in running was a 10K, and it was a Sporting Life 10K here in Toronto, and that's a race that, like, I think it's, like, 40, 30 or 40,000 people run this race. Mm -hmm. And it's a competitive race, but it's also raising money for Camp Hooch, which is great. But people, you know, can run this 10K like, I think the record for the course is like 15 minutes or something like that. Like it's, <laughs> it's, it's like a full on sprint. It's something, in, it's something insane. Um, there is zero chance that I will ever run that distance in 15 minutes. Yeah. Like there is no chance. But I had run my fastest time ever for a 10K during that time. And I got across the finish line. But there was still like, you know, 2,000 people or something that crossed the finish line faster than I did. Yeah. But it was all about the perspective again. I was just like, I'm in my own head using the perspective of, wow, for me, that was a huge accomplishment as opposed to focusing on the 2,000 people that crossed the finish line ahead of me who are probably, well, they are a lot faster, but they will forever be a lot faster sure. than I am. There's that, it's just something that, that maybe isn't attainable for me, um, which maybe goes against my whole NFL, I can play in the NFL. Thing. I was going to bring that up <laughs> next, but, <laughs> um, but, uh, that's only to say that my perspective in that moment was that I'm proud of my accomplishment as opposed to comparing myself against other people. And that's, I mean, that's a, a tale as old as time is I remember, you know, hearing that all growing up is don't compare yourself to other people. It's not, that is not healthy. And so I, in what you're saying, it's, it's so true. If you can do something and be proud of yourself for doing it and accomplishing that, you can always better your time. It's a race against yourself really. But, yeah. um, if you can find a way to be like pumped that you, you accomplished that thing that you wanted to do, that's all you need. I think, I think all that too goes back. Shout out my mom, Kelly. Uh, I was homeschooled okay. and I, I really think, and I don't have any proof cause I didn't go to the, I haven't done enough research, but I think that like the formal education system, uh, is, is terrible in a lot of the ways that Broken. it, it, you're working toward completing, um, something that's going to satisfy someone else's rubric mm -hmm. um, of what they are, are grading something on mm -hmm. and you're compared against everyone else in your class. You know, a lot of the time you can look, you know, who's top of the class and, and you know, do you, oh, did you get an A? No, I got a D. Like, you feel terrible about yourself. Yeah. That, that, that never came into play for me. Like, uh, never. And 
I think what I was told more to focus on is, is just like be passionate about learning something and, you know, follow that passion until, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't really want to learn about it anymore and then maybe go and try something else as opposed to being like, do all this blanket randomness and, and try to, uh, yeah, fulfill the goals set by, set by someone else that are maybe, you know, that uh, unrealistic for where you are at that moment. Mm-hmm. There's this meme that came out years ago and I bring this up a lot cause I think it's hilarious. Uh, but you see it every once in a while, but it's boy, am I glad that I learned so much about parallel parallelograms <laughs> in this parallelogram season as like a shot as like, we didn't yeah. know how to do taxes. Yeah. I apply very little to what I've learned in high school, like formal education to what I do now. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's people that do it more than I do, but, um, I think the thing is the structure and the root, like the, what was the term you said? The cube, the The rubric, the rubric. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, for that works for a lot of people that go into very specific careers, but it never, while they had that specific, uh, avenue in schools, they never had the thing for everybody else. Exactly. Yeah. Which is such a discredit for so many people. And yeah. maybe they're getting better. I don't know. It's been a long time since I've been there, but you hope so. Yeah. But yeah, I think that just kind of, yeah, it, 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 it doesn't help self-confidence. It does not. And I, I think that's where a lot of my insecurities spawn from. I was never a good student with anything. Uh, and it really took me a long time to like kind of come into my own. And it wasn't until I was long out of school, yeah. uh, navigating the world on my own. And even still it's, it's constantly happening. I'm constantly changing and learning new things, but, um, yeah, back in the day, sitting in history class or math class, learning about things that I didn't care about, I never would have anticipated being where I am today. Yeah. Um, I, I will say I wish I paid more attention to English class because <laughs> I do a lot of writing for like for work, and I just I, I I genuinely enjoy it now, whereas back then I didn't. I just kind of wished that I I got that uh, sooner. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm still learning things too, but the yeah. the English English is tough, even though I. I we had a required English minor in yeah. university. I hated that, uh, but I'm still learning. Like, where do you put do you put a comma here? Yeah, yeah. maybe it feels like I, I should, know. but I don't know. <laughs> I use Grammarly for everything. I use Grammarly yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, I thank God for uh, technology and making us dumb. But I know, <laughs> I know. Uh, I love it though. So important. Uh, cool. Um, uh, this is a bit of a just a fun, lighthearted thing. But who? Uh, well, first of all your talent business, like, where do you see that going? Do you want to stick strictly within the online influencer world type thing? Are you looking for, you know, do you want to break into film and television representing the, that kind of talent or what's your, what's your vision for I it? Know, like, I don't think I want to break into any kind of traditional sense. I would rather, because the, the business is changing so much and what you can, like what digital counts as digital these days is changing. And like, um, I would rather stick with what I've got right now and kind of explore the new things, new ventures and whatnot and platforms that come up as mm-hmm. opposed to, um, yeah, transitioning into something a little bit more traditional. It's not to say that like I have the answers of, of what that's going to be, but the only reasoning for that is that I think it's exciting to kind of be like, I don't know what it's going to be like and I don't know what I'm going to be doing two years from now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll probably be still working with, with hopefully a lot of the same people. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are different things that they're, they're like really, really new, but wildly successful too, is like doing uh, pro- like product lines of, you know, you, do, you see people putting out makeup lines that are making like insane amounts of money. Yeah. Um, it's like every YouTuber right now is putting out a merch yeah. line of some sort. Yeah. And something I want to do is like, I want to change some of that business too, though. Yeah. Because there are like kind of sketchy business practices going on with some of the companies that are coming to me like, we'll produce your merch. Here's the split of what it's going to be. And I'm just like, there are a lot of question marks around what (laughs) what these splits are are and like the quality of the products that you're doing. I think that's one big hole in the business right now is, uh, and something that I would love to to take my own business is working more into uh, kind of private label products. Um, so yeah, being the person who is, you know, let's create a, uh, skincare or, or makeup line that is actually vegan and cruelty free as opposed to like something that is quote unquote vegan cruelty free, but like, but we also test on animals for China because that's a regulation. Just like, <laughs> then don't sell your fucking products in China. Yeah. <laughs> like if they require you to do that, not that I'm like a massive champion for that, but, but, but like, it's, I, it's I, something I totally to think see what about. you're saying. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Very cool. So there's lots of opportunity within that world is what you're saying. Like you just, just like all these areas you haven't explored, which makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, that, that is, that's something that definitely excites me. And then apart from that, maybe, maybe starting up cool dance moves again. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, <knows? man. laughs> hey, I will come and film whatever you're, you're doing. I think it'll be hilarious. Uh, let's do it. Is there any, um, specific influencers that you're going after like you chasing down sam colder or what's the uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh i know sam colders i don't know him personally but i know i've i've talked to his he has a manager i've talked to his manager before yeah where there he probably doesn't know this but we're hopefully trying to put together something for this larger company that I probably shouldn't be talking about but yeah no uh <laughs> don't want to get in trouble we can cut it off but, here, but, but <laughs> sam, no it's fine but sam's yeah he's cool he's he's actually with one of my clients right now in uh sweden with uh volvo they're nice. doing some drifting around uh some ice courses and stuff that's that pretty cool that's pretty cool yeah that sounds really cool well that's uh, i guess that's the cool thing about the world right now is there's lots of that uh uncharted territory as far as um that part of the business which is a very exciting thing there's lots of people that want to be influencers and they're going to need a business mind to keep them on track <laughs> <laughs> and i'll also be the guy being like no just like don't take that selfie with that random uh, skinny tee. Don't do that. Yeah, yeah, don't do That's that. <laughs> you don't have the body type. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, what was the name of the person with 200 followers you said earlier? Brenda? Brenda or something? Brenda. Yeah. Or uh, 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 Bar Barbara? Barbara. 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 <laughs> That's it, yeah. Yeah, Barbara. That's Come on, it. Barbara. Get rid of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not <a> good. <laughs> amazing. Well, Jacob, thank you for, very much for being here. Uh, I've covered off a lot of stuff that I want to talk about. If there's anything else that you that we haven't crossed, feel free to... Throw I don't there, think but... so. Yeah, this has been cool. Thanks for having me. Cool. I mean, cool plays. You of course. S- yeah. I mean, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of uh, how the series goes. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, if people want to find out more about you, the stuff that you're involved in, your company, uh, you know, the running that you've done, you, you sent me a couple of links that I thought were very interesting. So like where, where should people go to check out more of your stuff? Yeah, probably uh, the best place to find me is either on Instagram or Twitter at Jacob Morris. Uh, if you want to check out my company, uh, goodfunpeople.com. Uh, otherwise, uh, you probably can't find me. Yeah. <laughs> Don't find my LinkedIn. And uh, <laughs> Don't talk to me there. And good dance moves. Cool dance moves. Cool dance moves, yeah. yeah they're not just good. They're cool. They're cool. <laughs> they're cool. Awesome. Thanks for checking out the Road Travel Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. For more information on Jacob and other episodes with other great guests, you can visit jessedhunt.com slash theroadtraveled. We'll see you next time.